welcome back in this lecture we will look at a particular approach to corrosion protection uh, that is referred to as anodic protection so some elements of this uh, approach has already been presented when we introduced corrosion so this approach to ca corrosion protection is most relevant to certain class of metals like aluminum, titanium, and so on, where the exothermicity of um, oxidation of metal is very high. That is, the delta G of uh, oxidation is quite negative. So for these metals, anodic protection is uh, most relevant. So what is observed? So when you are in this region at these potential, um, corrosion is fairly significant. This is the active region where corrosion is significant. Um, I indicate the corrosion current. As you progress along the anodic potential, a passivation layer is formed which significantly suppresses corrosion. So the current goes from this value and drops down to almost zero. So as you go further, passivation continues. In this region, uh, you have a stable passive region, but as you go to even more anodic potentials, the passive layer is destroyed and corrosion current is resumed. So what we are interested in anodic protection is in this region. So we won't have a stable passive layer which suppresses corrosion in these class of metals and alloys. So we can look at some qualitative factors affecting the stability of the passive layer. One is um, a criteria developed long time ago based on the volume of the metal oxide passive layer compared to volume of the metal that was involved in forming this passive layer. So what is um, intuitively uh, being communicated is that supposing we have a metal surface, some part of the metal is converted to a metal oxide surface. So this M indicates the metal and some part of the metal surface has been converted to metal oxide with this particular formula. A and B are stoichiometric coefficients, um, uh, indicative of the stoichiometry of the metal oxide. Intuitively, you would anticipate that for the metal oxide layer to be covering the metal surface, the volume of the metal oxide form should not be much less than the volume of the metal uh, which was involved in the formation of metal oxide. As opposed to thinking about volume, it, is, it would have been much better to have thought through areas, but uh, these two gentlemen, um, Pilling and Bedford, uh, came up with a criteria which is often referred to as the pilling bedworth criteria, wherein the volumes are compared. So metal M oxide refers to the molar mass of uh, metal oxide divided by the density of the metal oxide gives you an idea of um, um, volume occupied by the metal oxide. When you divide this volume, okay, by this gives you the volume of the metal that was involved in forming this metal oxide. Molar mass of metal divided by the density of the metal will give you the uh, volume of the metal that was involved in forming this metal oxide. So intuitively, what you would expect is that if this area, the area formed by the metal oxide is much less than the metal surface, then the passivation layer will not be effective, right? So 
uh, instead of comparing the areas, they came up with a criteria involving uh, volumes, but it is a fairly useful ratio. So we continue to use this ratio. So if you compute this quantity, if this quantity is much less than one, then the oxide will not completely cover the metal surface. So the metal is not protected by the passivating layer. So for you, for the metal to be protected by the oxide, the pilling bedford ratio has to be between one and two. In this case, this area uh, of the metal oxide is comparable to the area of the underlying metal surface. So if the ratio is much greater than two, that is the volume of the oxide form is much more than the volume of the metal from which the oxide was formed, what you would anticipate, the metal oxide will buckle, right? To accommodate uh, that increased volume or increased surface, the metal oxide will buckle and delaminate. So this will not offer uh, good pro corrosion protection by passivation. So that has to be avoided. So if you want uh, good protection by uh, passivation, you want to have the pilling bedford ratio in this uh, regime. Moving on, we have also looked at another feature of passivation. Passivation, uh, let's say, uh, can be analyzed via the pore bay diagram. So what the pore bay diagram does is that as you go towards the anodic potential, you ask when would the passivating layer be formed, right? So that is very much dependent upon the pH. Um, so at different pH, the passivation layers are more easily formed. For example, in this region, the passivation uh, layer is uh, more easily formed, but in more acidic pH, it takes a greater anodic potential to form the passivating region. We have discussed in fairly good amount of detail how to utilize pore bed diagram in corrosion. Please look at the previous lecture to understand the different parts of this uh, pore bed diagram. Moving on, we can utilize Ivan's diagram to think through the current requirements in anodic protection. So a lot of information is presented. Let's look at the different segments of this picture. Okay, so in the active region, what you have is that there is anodic current and there is a cathodic current. So IC indicates the cathodic current. When you match the anodic current with the cathodic current, you get the corrosion potential and corresponding to the corrosion potential, you have the corrosion current. You don't want to be in this regime. So to suppress corrosion, you want to go from greater anodic current to lesser anodic current. So when you do that, you are at uh, anodic potential. What is observed is that corresponding to decrease in the anodic, anodic current because of the increase in anodic potential, what is to be noticed is that at high anodic potential, the cathodic current also decreases significantly, right? So this is the line indicating the variation of cathodic current as a function of potential. As you increase the potential to more anodic uh, values, the cathodic current also comes down. So the remaining part, that is the difference between the anodic current here and the cathodic current, which is here, which is almost negligible, this current has to be provided by a potentiostat. Okay, so this is the applied current. Potentiostat is an equipment which can maintain a particular potential. Potential and stat, static is combined together to form this word potential stat. So this electrochemical equipment, which is central 
to any electrochemical experimentation. Uh, uh, you, most of the research lab will have uh, three to four, uh, half a dozen potential stat in, uh, in, in a particular lab. So with this potential stat, you not only apply a particular potential, which significantly reduces the corrosion from this value to this value. And what is evident from this uh, Ivan's diagram is that the difference between this and this is supplied. The difference in current, cathodic current, is supplied by the potential step. Moving further, you, you have another scenario um, wherein uh, you want to look at the cathodic currents uh, when you change the potential. So the cathodic current relevant to this particular system can be oxygen reduction reaction, for example. Okay. So what we want to aim here is that we want to match the anodic current via the cathodic current itself. Okay. So in this case, in the active corrosion region, um, the intersection of the anodic current with the cathodic current, the cathodic current is indicated by this dashed line, gives you the corrosion potential and the corrosion current. You don't want to be in this region. When you increase the potential to the more anodic regime, what you want to have is that the cathodic current should match the anodic current. To make that possible, one way you can try to do that is to increase the exchange current density of the cathodic current. When you increase the exchange current density, this line is moved up. Um, so this shift upwards is an indicative of increase in exchange current density. When that occurs, uh, the cathodic current itself will match the anodic current. And this establishes the new corrosion potential and the corrosion current. Because it is oxygen reduction reaction, uh, the, this reaction typically uh, faces a lot of mass transport limitation. So what one may have is that uh, you may not have uh, this feature but you may have this feature, this indicative of significant mass transfer limitation. So because of significant mass transfer limitation, what may happen is that the cathodic current might intersect the anodic current in this region. So when that happens, you have significant corrosion. You do not want to do that. So you want to make sure that you have improved the mass transfer characteristic in such a manner that the limiting current density is it is above it is more than this re region okay so you don't intersect um, this part of the anodic current in this regime if the limiting current density is outside of this regime here uh, d shows uh, increase in limiting current density. You typically, that will occur by improving uh, the mass transport features involved uh, underlying this reduction process or decreasing the mass transfer resistance. Uh, two things uh, to summarize. You want to be increasing the anodic potential. With that, there's a corresponding increase in exchanging exchange current density with respect to cathodic current and you don't want to have the limiting current intersecting uh, in this regime. Moving on, we will look at one of the most important uh, protection strategies for corrosion, which is to do with cathodic protection. That'll be the topic of discussion in the next lecture. Thank you.